Hi, my name's Jeremy Brune, and I've got a story to tell you that might shock you. It's from my early days of woodworking. Let's start with the early days of woodworking, such as in Egyptian times. Pieces of wood were extended by lashing splices together. So early on we learned that strong joints involve fibre overlap and the famous mortise and tenon is a mechanical joint. Then along came glues derived from animal and fish bones and more recently modern glues based on science. And we began to rely on the glue alone such as in side or edge grain bonding whereas before reinforcement was used. And in an age of liquid nails, it's tempting to believe that end grain makes a strong glued joint. Now for my shocking story about gluing end grain. First about my background, I was one of 14 kids raised after the war. Life was tough. And in the winters when it was cold, we would all sit huddled around the dinner table, our hands stretching out towards a big candle in the centre of the table. And when it was really cold, father would light the candle. Okay, so as a young furniture designer, I set up a small workshop uh, with no capital. In fact, I could not even borrow 50 quid from the bank. I was struggling to make a living from my modern designs as the demand was for antiques at that time. One day an elderly gentleman came into my workshop. He lived in the same street. I agreed to make him a simple coffee table for £25. Well, I soon realised I had massively underpriced the table and I cannot believe to this day what I did and despite my training. I used the only machine I had, a second-hand radial arm saw and I cut butt joints gluing the table together with just PVA glue. On completion, an excited customer returned with his wife to collect the table, which was made of pine. My upholsterer friend John was present. He had a workshop next door. And as the happy couple took the table, at one leg in each hand, John and I looked at each other, dreading what was going to happen. Give it five minutes, I said. Well, there was a knock on the door and a profusely apologetic customer arrived holding the table, less one leg, that his wife was carrying. I told him not to worry and promised to fix it free of charge. Well, John later said, don't forget when quoting for future jobs, mention in small print, that joints will be extra. My only excuse is that I had rent to pay, but it was just a momentary slip of judgment and a rebellious streak that I could do anything with wood. I'm not afraid or ashamed to admit it now that I made an error of judgment based largely on economic pressure at the time. Well, individuals and nations make mistakes Today everything is being challenged, often in a binary way, where evidence is selective and does not tell the whole story. So what is the truth about grain gluing? OK, let's look at my small table, because it's a perfect example of grain gluing. Note the thicker lines are glue lines. The table achieves some strength because it is an integrated structure. The forces acting on it are not strictly tensile or shear, but are a combination coming from all directions. The main weakness is in the leg as it becomes a lever. Where the leg joins with the horizontal rail and the top are weak bonds. It doesn't matter that I'm not showing end-to-end -end gluing because the principle is the same. In a structural situation where there are stresses, end grain joints require reinforcement. 
such as dowels or mortise and tenons. An important factor is wood shrinks and expands across the grain according to humidity in a domestic environment. And over time joints can open as the wood dries out. So the principle is that in a practical situation, not in a clinical scientific experiment, end grain joints require reinforcement. But in a non-stress situation, end grain bonding with just glue is okay, such as in the parquetry art of oystering. The claim that modern glues are stronger than the wood is not just a marketing thing, but it's true as the fibres sever when the joint fails. It's not the glue that fails. But all this can be deceptive as this recent scientific experiment demonstrated. Note the actual surface area of the glue joint is identical in A and B. And the end grain glue joint is B. So which joint breaks first? And just remind yourself of the chair bodger who is cleaving the log, which easily splits the fibres apart. The end grain joint at B is strongest, but, but this should not come as a surprise. As most woodworkers know that when you square off a panel of edge glued boards, the offcut easily breaks apart. So where does this lead us? As we have two truths here. To the binary world that I spoke of earlier, where science, like statistics, can be used to manipulate, we can be led to believe that we've been fooled for years that glue only end grain joints are weak. But why do leading glue manufacturers advise to reinforce glued end grain joints? Possibly to avoid liability if this happens? So in a real life situation, most woodwork is structural and the only scientific constant is that lignum which binds wood fibres together is weaker than the glue and in this binary world we can choose between theory or practice. So the claim that end grain joints are twice as strong as side grain joints may be true in a cleverly presented laboratory test and it doesn't matter which way you spin it, but many people are getting the wrong end of the stick. And I didn't think I would be defending tradition as I spent much of the past 50 years challenging tradition in the furniture I create. And for much of this time, tradition has been unquestioned. Now myths are not being challenged, but created. And suddenly what has been written in books is to be negated about what we actually know about wood and how to work it. Well, thanks for watching and please subscribe if you like my videos.